Welcome back to the HTML5 Essential Training Series. In this tutorial, we're going to talk about an introduction to HTML. HTML is a big part of HTML5, obviously. So let's go through and talk a little bit about HTML and the history of HTML. An introduction to HTML. It's the mission of OnTarget HTML5 to develop and deliver concise and accurate training materials to our audiences. We will continually update the materials to reflect the most recent information available to make certain that the viewers are receiving accurate information during all of our presentations, as you will see. So welcome to an introduction to HTML. HTML is a standard markup for creating web pages that will be viewed on the World Wide Web. HTML, or, or hypertext markup language, is the scripting language used to structure web pages. This introduction will introduce you to the scripting language and briefly discuss the history of the HTML markup language. At the root of the success of the World Wide Web is a simple to learn text-based markup language that any device with basic web browser can read. That's HTML. Every web page requires at least some HTML in order for it to be displayed on the web. It would not be a web page without it. So exactly what is a markup language? In our first lesson, we actually talked a little bit about markup languages. We did a very, very brief introduction, and then we just jumped into making a basic template. In this presentation, I'm going to get into depth as to what a markup language is, what HTML is, a little bit of the history of HTML, a little bit of the history of the web or the W3C standards. And I think it's very important as a web developer to understand where we came from so that you you'll have a better understanding as to where we're going. You don't have to watch this tutorial if you want. This is more as a, of a history of HTML and a history of the markup language. Completely up to you. But I think as a good web developer, it's important to know a little bit about where we came from as we're moving into HTML5. So to better understand the question, what is a markup language, let's, let's take a look at how markup languages began. Authors develop the written manuscript of printed material that he wishes to have printed. And that's what you'll see on the left-hand side of your screen. You see a written manuscript. An author writes out a manuscript. The document's marked up to indicate to the printer how the text should be displayed on the printed page. You'll see my markup on my little written document there. This is very similar to how we mark up web pages to be displayed in a web browser. Concise annotations were needed to allow the printer to understand exactly how the printed documents should appear. And that's what we're doing in this document right here. We actually make annotations on that page to the printer, explaining to them how we feel the page should be presented when it's put on paper. We do a lot of the same things in a web browser. As we write up our HTML markup language, we're telling the browser, this is how this should be displayed in that browser. So a series of commonly recognized abbreviations were formed so that the printer and the author each understood how the document should appear when printed. So we've got all the markup, we do all our markup languages, we mark up the document, and on the right, then we have the printed book. We have a text document based on how we've marked up our original script. HTML is a modern markup language that uses common abbreviations referred to as tags to direct the web browsers, Internet Explorer, Opera, Firefox, Google Chrome, or Safari, that's to name a few, how the author of the web document would like the web document displayed in the browser window. So basically that's what we're doing with our markup language. We're telling our web browser, regardless of what web browser it is, how that document should appear when it's viewed on the World Wide Web. You're going to see as you learn HTML and as you go through these training series that different browsers treat treat some of those markup tags a little bit differently. So there's some things that we have to do a little bit differently depending upon the audience and the browser that they're using to view it. All right, so the beginnings of HTML. How HTML began. HTML was devised in the late 1980s by a British scientist named Tim Berners-Lee while he was working at the Particle Physics Laboratory in CERN, Switzerland. The simplicity of the HTML, HTML scripting language led to its popularity in the very early days of the Internet with browsers that at the time were text-based. The ease at which scientists and engineers could share their information led to the exchange of ideas that rapidly decreased the time required to develop new technologies. A major development 
with the scripting language came in 1993 when a college student named Mark Anderson added an image tag to the scripting language so that HTML could also display graphics along with text. This new version of the scripting language was included in the Mosaic web browser from the National Center for Some Supercomputing Applications, or the NCSA, and was immediately very successful. Mark went on to establish the Netscape web browser, a very popular browser during the beginning of the internet, but not in use very much today. Netscape was in the in the late mid to nineteen mid eighteen nineteen eighties the late nineteen eighties. Netscape was what Internet Explorer is today. Netscape was the only real web browser out there. That's when a lot of us began actually doing web development. Is when the image tag came along, it actually opened up a lot more things in the internet for people other than engineers and scientists. A lot of colleges then started moving into that platform to exchange ideas and information. What I find surprising, even after all these years after the introduction of the Mosaic browser, many of the characteristics of the most popular browsers, Internet Explorer, Firefox, Safari, and Google Chrome, still retain many of the characteristics of the original Mosaic graphical user interface, that the interactive experience of browsing the web. By the mid-1990s, the commercial appeal of the web began to be recognized by browser manufacturers and as such, those manufacturers began to modify their browsers to allow them to push the limits of HTML. Web browser manufacturers began to fight for a bigger share of the market, realizing that the web could become a tool to allow for a revenue stream for their company if they only knew where the web was going. Back in the mid-1990s, very few of us, because that's about the time that I was actually getting into web development, very few of us had the foresight to really see just how big the web would become. They had no idea how true that statement would become. Manufacturers began adding their own unique proprietary tags to the HTML scripting language to effectively create their own versions of HTML and thus added additional functionality to their specific browser. This became a nightmare for web developers as now they were developing across numerous different browser platforms and many of the brow browsers had their own unique way of displaying information. When I was coming into developing in the web in the 90s, in the 1990s, every browser treated things differently. Now, text was pretty much standard across all the browsers, but there were different attribute tags for images. There were different attribute tags for links. Things were handled a little bit differently for displaying columns and formats and tables. So... As you were writing for the web, you were actually writing for different types of browser applications. And even to this day, I mean, there's still some things that we'll have to do. As you're going to see as you go through this HTML5 Essential training, there are still some things that you have to do for different browsers as you're developing your applications on the web. But today, it's much, much easier than it was 20 years ago, believe me, whereas almost every page was substantially different from one browser platform to the next. This lack of standardization for the markup language not only proved to be a headache for the web developers, but also for the users of the internet. As users and developers were finding it very difficult to display or gather information as numerous different browsers were needed based on the internet address you were visiting. You would actually, there was actually a time when based on the site you were going to, that would determine the type of browser or the browser that you would need to view that site that internet connection. Now keep in mind, the internet in the 1990s was nothing like it is today. Most of it was between universities and corporations, the military, but still, universities were finding that depending upon the types of servers that were displaying those pages for that particular university would determine the type of browser that was needed to view them. It was a, it was a true headache. Changes were needed to better standardize the development of HTML. And that's true. I mean, as the, late, as the 90s were coming to a close, everyone that was doing web development was beginning to realize, you know what, we really need a standardization body. Someone's got to step in and start bringing this thing together so that not only could the web and development grow, but the World Wide Web could grow because things would become more standardized. As they became more standardized, it would accelerate in growth. We had no idea how much it would accelerate in growth. 
the beginnings of a standardization body or the W3C. Thus was born the World Wide Web Consortium or W3C. The W3C recognized that a fragmented HTML scripting language would defeat the purpose in the development of the World Wide Web and create an environment that would not be conducive to the growth of the web. At the direction of Tim Berners-Lee, they set about setting up a governing body that would oversee the development and implementation of the HTML scripting language. Sounds like a simple and noble task, doesn't it? As you can imagine, the market leaders in the browser application industry did not take kindly to having their browsers told that they needed to follow guidelines in the processing of the markup language. Because what the W3C was trying to do actually did sound very noble. And it did sound like it was very simple. Let's standardize the language. Let's set up a, a group of standards for all of our web applications, for all of our web browsers, so that as pages are served up on the web, everybody can view them. But keep in mind, we had four or five major manufacturers in our browsers. Each one of them was constantly trying to grow their market share. So they thought their ideas were the best ideas for the standard product. And they weren't always the best idea. And again, still have some of that today. Tim was adamant in the setting about putting together a governing body that would not only grow the web, but make it as easy as possible for people to add information, to grow sites, develop materials, and set about establishing standards that all could adhere to. He knew that in order to do this effectively, he would need a cross-functional group of individuals that would look out for what was best in the growth of the World Wide Web and allow for input from all areas of web development. He requested and received input from the brightest minds in the industry as the W3C began to grow. At first, there was a lot of pushback from browser manufacturers as they had developed their platforms, some of which were very popular and did not want to surrender their portions of the market. After many years of struggling to establish some type of standardization, we're finally getting to the point where most browser manufacturers have adopted the standards and in most cases, browsers today display information on a pretty consistent basis. That's not to say that they're 100% compliant with the standards, but on the whole, we are getting pretty close to compliancy. There are still times, as you'll see, as you work your way through the tutorials in this Essentials Training Series, that some browser manufacturers are still behind in reaching the goal of supporting all the HTML tags available. You're going to, you're going to find that out as we're working through these exercises. There's still some things that we have to do to workarounds, or I call them workarounds, for specific browser manufacturers because they don't support all the attributes or tags that are currently available in HTML. But it's much easier today to develop for the web than it ever has been. Believe me, if you compare what you have to do today to develop for the web as compared to the mid-1990s or late 1990s, there is no comparison. The knowledge that we had to have back then was a hundred times what it is today to develop for the web. Because again, as I said, not only was the scripting language not truly standard, but none of the browsers themselves were standard. So you were pretty much writing based on the browser that you were using to view. That's not to say that it's easy to develop for the web today, because it's not easy. I mean, there's still a lot of things you need to learn. There's still a lot of things that we can do on the web. And in fact, in some ways, it's a lot more challenging. I won't say it's a lot more difficult, but it's a lot more challenging. There's things that we're doing on the web today that were never dreamed of in mid-1990. We had no idea the way that video would take off. We had no idea the way that audio would take off. We had no idea the way that interactive applications that are actually web-based would take off. But that's where HTML5 comes in. HTML5 now is becoming a standard for the HTML platform, for the HTML scripting language that standardizes how video is done, how audio is done, how we can have interactive applications, Canvas for, for drawing on the web, stuff that's never been available before is now becoming standardized. It wasn't long ago that as a web developer, you had to write to a specific browser more often than not. And in order to maintain a site for a client and get the most impact from that site, there was very specific code sprinkled throughout the site addressing individual browser peculiarities. That's how we had to do things 10 years ago. That's the exception now instead of the rule. The W3C is still directed at the time of this recording by Tim Berners-Lee. 
He stuck in there and has grown the standardization team to a very large group of individuals that develop, manufacture, and design for the World Wide Web. I've had the pleasure of meeting him. He is a very, very intelligent gentleman, and he's, he's hung, in, hung in there. He's done it. He basically, the dream that he had in the early 1990s, he is watching it now come to fruition. The members, which many of us are part of, have, put, have input into all aspects of web, stand, web standardization and web development. The W3C still looks for input from the web community as the web continues to grow and expand around the world. The dream of having a place to gather and post information is now becoming a reality. HTML 4.1, the last recommended version of HTML is version 4.01. That's the standard that everyone's on even today. But in 2014, rapidly approaching is HTML 5, which will soon be another section of tutorials on the website. What HTML5, that's the whole purpose of this site, will become or is scheduled to become the new standard in 2014. It is going to open up a whole new world to web development. This group of courses will cover HTML40, keeping in mind that with the addition of HTML5, we'll be adding increased functionality to an already very functioning scripting language. So this introduction to HTML that we're talking about, or HTML5, the essential training, is going to cover a lot of stuff from HTML4 because all that is part of the HTML5 scripting language. But we're also going to get into a whole lot of new things that HTML5 is bringing to the table. It's highly recommended that you have a good background in HTML4.01 before undertaking HTML5, as HTML5 is a subset of HTML 4.01, and there are areas of HTML 5 that are extremely complex. The Canvas areas of HTML 5 are things that we've never done before. So ha having a good understanding of the HTML scripting language is essential to learning HTML 5, and that's why this is part of the HTML 5 Essential Training Series. So wrapping up, there you have it. You have a brief history of HTML and how we arrived at where we are today. This is a very exciting time in the history of the web as things are changing very rapidly to allow for the display of web information on devices that a few years ago were only dreamed of. Think about where we're at. We are doing things today on a phone that five years ago weren't even possible on the web. This is a great time to be a web developer. Welcome to On Target HTML5 and I hope you enjoy the future tutorial series of this HTML5 Essential Training. I really enjoy hearing from the users of the website. If you have any comments or suggestions for the site, just drop me a line. I'll be glad to consider them. If you have things that you think should be part of the site, don't hesitate to drop me a line. I will be glad to talk about adding additional information to the site or updating some information. If you've seen something in the site that you think needs additional information, drop me an email. I will be glad to consider it and add it. This concludes our introduction to HTML. I hope you enjoy the rest of the series.